Good afternoon to you all and welcome to the panel on Edmund Burke and the limits of toleration, a panel organized uh, in association with the Burke Society of America and the Russell Kirk Center. Uh, allow me as a host to um, say some words in the guise of a brief opening address. Firstly, the background of the meeting new authoritarian challenges to liberal democracy. Secondly, the subject of the session, Edmund Burke. Thirdly, the theme of the discussion, the limits of toleration. Liberal democracy is the proper political realm of toleration. To strike a balance between actions of power and the uses of power is a challenge for every liberal democratic society a challenge that is in a perpetual renovation to the deepness of time. In this panel, we are not far from the contingencies of the real world, but the real world thin and alive to the distance, detachment, and sensibility of political philosophy. The subject is Edmund Burke. Burke himself had devoted an existence in public life to defending the principle of publicity and calling the executive power to account. We, he had also consistently committed himself to the principle of toleration, yet enlightened ideals had to prove their own enabled conditions. It made no sense to permit the freedom of speculation to destroy, uh, sorry, to destroy the very foundations of speculation. Similarly, it was counterproductive to allow liberty of discussion and publication to destroy the conditions of public political freedom. This is a question of all times, namely how to address the pretensions of self-appointed representatives of enlightened positions whose doctrines promise to overthrow what they hope to realize. The discussions the discussion is on Edmund Burke and the limits of toleration. Within a liberal democracy, a considerable degree of doctrinal diversity is inevitable and should be tolerated. But on the other hand, the civil authorities are charged with the maintenance of a stable social order, harmony and unity. They cannot tolerate actions which are subversive of these things. Disputes which split society into warring factions or the expression of opinions uh, which are likely to incite people to illegal or antisocial actions. Private opinions and feelings cannot be controlled, therefore must be tolerated. But in so far as opinions and feelings are publicly expressed or give rise to action, they fall within the proper scale of human law, and toleration is open to the considerations of the common good. The liberal philosopher dislikes all kinds of limitations, but the question flies fast, sound, and swiftly. What is the exact political place for the concept of an unconditional tolerance? Uh, thank you for your patience and for your attention. After these uh, brief remarks, and without further ado, I will end the floor to the first speaker of this session, Professor Greg Wiener. Please, uh, at your convenience, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thank you to, to uh, all of you, and particularly to the, uh, uh, I almost said the Ian Crow Society, the, the Edmund Burke Society, and the uh, uh, the, the, the Kirk Society as well for convening the uh, panel on this very important topic. Uh, I want to speak on uh, toleration and custom, which exist in some tension in, uh, in Burke's thought. Uh, early in the reflections on the revolution in France, Burke makes a passing remark that speaks uh, to uh, the topic of the limits of toleration. Uh, the context is his bait noir, uh, Richard Price's suggestion that those who dislike the Church of England uh, should set up their own houses of worship on their own principles. Uh, Burke was himself a defender of both an established church and official toleration. Uh, he said to Parliament in 1773 that toleration was the most reliable support for Christianity, a religion that, uh, in his words, had conquered the world. 
uh, without state support. Uh, so why did Burke uh, object to uh, Price's conception of toleration? And the answer is, and so perfectly indifferent concerning the doctrine which may be taught in them. His zeal is of a curious character. It is not for the propagation of his own opinions, but of any opinions. It is not for the diffusion of truth, but for the spreading of contradiction. Let the noble teachers but dissent. It is no matter from whom or from what. Uh, Burke's observation is a bracing reminder of the dangers of a theory of toleration that makes toleration itself the point. Uh, on that foundation, there can be no limits precisely because if toleration is the goal, more of it is always better than less. What Burke recognizes is that toleration as an end to itself is inherently corrosive. Uh, it does not facilitate the pursuit of truth. Rather, it is the deformed version of what American universities now uh, fetishize as critical thinking. On this understanding, critical thinking is all critique and no thinking. The critique is not the noble kind. It is not analysis for the purpose of understanding. Rather, it is deconstruction for deconstruction's sake. Its effect is exactly the danger Burke observes about price. When one deconstructs but never builds, uh, nihilism is the unavoidable result. We contradict everything and believe in nothing. Burke understands the purpose of religious toleration by contrast, as well as other kinds of toleration to be the diffusion of truth. One can dispute the object, but the fact that an object exists is what prevents toleration from acting as an acid that dissolves any assertion of truth. That is a helpful framework, I think, for understanding Burke's views about custom as well. Custom provides boundaries for toleration, not in the sense that it indicates a standard of suppression, but rather because it supplies an orienting purpose. Uh, in the reflections, Burke suggestively describes liberties in this context, quoting him now, it has been the uniform policy of our constitution to claim and assert our liberties as an entailed inheritance derived to us from our forefathers and to be transmitted to our posterity. As an estate specially belonging to the people of this kingdom without reference whatever to any other more general or prior right. Entail is the law according to which estates must be transmitted intact. Its purpose is the general preservation, generational preservation rather, of estates. In that sense, entail is manifestly intolerant. It, it uh, limits personal freedom at any one moment in time to maintain intergenerational commitments over time. Applying this concept of civil liberties has two effects. One is to suggest a principle of limitation uh, liberty is not a freeform abstraction. It is defined in a concrete tradition whose heirs are obligated to transmit it intact. The second is that it supplies a means of, but also a purpose for adaptation. Burke observes that, quote, the idea of inheritance furnishes a sure principle of conservation and a sure principle of transmission without at all excluding a principle of improvement. Uh, Burke go on to liken this to, quote, preserving the method of nature in the conduct of the state, uh, such that in what we improve, we are never wholly new, and what we retain, we are never wholly obsolete. Uh, he continues, by adhering in this manner and on those principles to our forefathers, we are guided not by the superstition of antiquarians, but by the spirit of philosophic analogy. That latter distinction requires our uh, attention. Burke adheres to custom not out of superstitious reverence, but rather out of both moral obligation and generational utility. The philosophic analogy to which he refers is, quote, adopting our fundamental laws into the bosom of our family affections. Improvement grounded in this way is also improvement that lasts. It endures. Most important, however, it is manifestly not progress for the sake of progress progress as an intrinsic good unsusceptible of limitation. Later in the reflections, Burke provides his standard of political or constitutional reform. It includes this, quote, I would not exclude alteration neither, but even when I changed, it should be to preserve. He continues, quote, in what I did, I should follow the example of our ancestors. I would make the reparation as nearly as possible in the style of the building. We note in, in reflecting on that passage that alteration is neither an intrinsic right nor an end to itself. Uh, Burke would emphatically reject our contemporary calls for change for change's sake for the same reason he rejects Price's call to proliferate churches. It has no purpose and consequently has no limits. The point of reform for Burke is to reanimate, not to replace the underlying principles of a regime. 
that we've encountered two analogies that provide both a limiting principle and an animating purpose for change. One is inheritance. The other is Burke's frequent use of real estate as a metaphor. Both are suggestive. I explain Burke's position to students in the following way. Suppose you inherit a manor house that has been passed down in your family for generations and that you are expected to transmit it to posterity. The house does not, uh, uh, does not suit your contemporary taste, so you tear it down and replace it with something in the style of modern architecture. Have you done something imprudent or something immoral? Burke's answer is both. Such an act of destruction is imprudent because a home transmitted through generations reflects the accumulated wisdom of custom. It, it contains what Burke says the common law reflects, uh, quote, the collected reason of ages. His point is that a reasonable person understands the limits of reason. He will defer to the wisdom of his ancestors projected over time, not because they are never wrong, but rather because he is not always right. Custom applies that principle to circumstance over time. But there's an equally important sense in which the person who destroys this home has also done something substantively wrong, not merely unwise. Uh, we bear substantive obligations on Burke's account, not only to our descendants, but also to our ancestors. This latter point, an obligation to the dead, is especially foreign to contemporary ears. Burke best captures the concept in his famous appropriation of the language of social contract theory. Society, he writes, is indeed a contract. Uh, but it is not, he explains, a contract in transient commodities. Rather, he continues, quote, it is a partnership in all science, a partnership in all art, a partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. As the ends of such a partnership cannot be obtained in many generations, it becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. In other words, Burke says we bear moral contractual obligations to our ancestors and our descendants because we are engaged in a project no one of us can complete. Destroying the manor house for the sake of transient and contemporary tastes dishonors the work of those who came before us and despoils the inheritance of those who will succeed us. All this suggests that toleration is limitable in the specific sense that it is oriented toward a purpose. I, I do not mean uh, that for Burke, its limits should necessarily be imposed through law. The key is that toleration be limited in principle. Without such a principle, toleration corrodes not just any one belief, but rather belief itself. Custom provides a principle of limitation by demonstrating that adaptation also has an orienting purpose. Those who wrongly accuse Burke of historicism, of locating truth in traditions that drift over time, overlook this point. Uh, because there are limits to individual reason at any one moment, custom is, for Burke, the most reliable instrument for pursuing and transmitting truth while habituating us to its teachings. In this sense, custom is flexible. It can adapt itself over time slowly, but its purpose is fixed. The purpose is twofold, and I will close on this point. Uh, the first uh, purpose is the preservation and transmission of truth. The second is the core Burkean virtue of prudence in its truest and most Thomistic sense. There are universal truths. There are also many paths to attaining right ends. Prudence chooses among these, and custom reflects those choices through particular traditions. By imposing horizons on goals like progress and change, Burke's notion of custom tells us that we cannot tolerate for the sake of tolerating. Rather, tolerating is guided, and toleration rather, is guided and bounded in principle by its ends. These are pursued through and housed in the fixed purposes and flexible nature of custom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nitsa, uh, for this uh, illuminating and very um, striking um, presentation. Uh, we will now move for our next speaker, and please, uh, Professor Ian Krau, the floor is yours at your beginning, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you for the, to the um, Estoril Political Forum for giving me this opportunity to uh, participate uh, among Burkeans, Burke scholars, and, uh, and more widely on the issue of uh, challenges to liberal democracy. Uh, and thank you um, to um, my, the, the, the last speaker for what I think is one of the nicest compliments I've ever been uh, 
been paid, uh, except because my wife, uh, I think you'll find that my um, paper, uh, which is called Edmund Burke's Narrow Line Between Toleration and Slavery, I'm hoping will offer some uh, support uh, in a small area for uh, Dr. Wiener's uh, thesis. Edmund Burke published his reflections on the revolution in France primarily as a warning to his fellow countrymen on the threat posed to British freedom and the constitution by a misreading of the aims of the French revolutionary program. In particular, Burke feared any concession to British radicals based upon a questionable interpretation of the legacy of the glorious revolution and of the so-called rights of man. Similarly, while Western liberal democracy might face powerful challenges today from foreign governments and ideologies, one would be blind indeed not to recognize that the most urgent threat appears to come from ideologies. Um, I, I have been informed that I'm about to be cut out of the um, internet. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could no, switch. No, 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 you're perfectly, uh, we are, we, we are early, early in you, we are hearing you and you are seeing you perfectly, no problem. You are on here, son. If, no. if I disappear, please um, pass on to, to the next. No, you, definitely you will not disappear. Oh, definitely you disappear. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so we, we will move now to the next speaker, which uh, is Professor Yvonne Moreira, please. Uh, and we resume the communication of Professor Ian Kraut as soon as he is uh, able to reconnect to us. Okay, Professor Yvonne Moreira, please, the floor is yours, okay? And mute yourself, and mute. You are on mute. Again, unmute, unmute yourself. Okay. 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 Uh, no, no, perfectly. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the for the invitation to, uh, and uh, it's a, it's an honor to be here and uh, and in such a good company, and to uh, such a, a good audience. And my subject will be a view on Burke's elitist doctrine of political representation. Uh, in his Bristol speech at the end of the first election, Burke claims that he believes the representatives should live in close and frank communication with their voters, that he should sacrifice his rest and his personal interests to theirs, but that he cannot abdicate the independence of his decisions. Autonomous opinion and the enlightened conscience of the parliamentarian should not be sacrificed to any group or individual, as sacrificing them to the opinion of voters would be to betray them instead of serving them. Parliament being representative of the whole nation, a member of parliament is not merely the representative for the particular constituency who elected him, and because parliament is a place where the national interest is debated and which has the capacity to legislate in accordance with it, since the national interest cannot be reduced to the sum of the various local interests, the parliamentarian cannot rescind their own assessment of what the nation's interests are, placing it in the hands of their voters. It will be through the discussion between different interests that the notion of the interest of the nation will emerge, very concrete, and which may gain substance in the adoption of the defense of an apparently individual interest that, in the circumstances, better represents the interest of the whole. As happened when Burke defended Ireland's commercial interests and Bristol voters felt threatened, Burke justified himself then by stating that the defending free trade and protecting that freedom for Irish traders aligned with Bristol's interests, even though it did not seem evident to them at that time. No individual interest can take precedence over the broader interest, uh, because what is so conceived will not end up expressing an authentic individual interest, since what endangered the whole can tr cannot truly serve the part. I quote, 
if the local constituent should have an interest or should form an hasty opinion evidently oppose, uh, opposite to the real good of the rest of the community, the member for that place ought to be as far as any other from any endeavor to give it effect." End of quote. The opinion of the voter who does not have to take into account the interests of the entire nation, much less to impartially take into account opposing interests, should not compel his representative to obey his requests, because government is a matter of reason, not of will. I quote, if government were a matter of will upon any side, yours without passion ought to be superior. But government and legislation are matters of reason and judgment, and not of inclination. Dave, uh, end of quote. David Beatham uh, believes that Burke does not claim for the parliamentarian a superior capacity for deliberation relative to the voters, as would appear, uh, as would happen uh, in an elitist theory of representation. Beatham argues that Burke's statements only indicate that Burke understood that decisions should be made in the place where debate takes place and not far from the forum. However accurate, Beatham's argument does not seem to capture Burke's theory of representation in all its aspects. It is true that he understands that decisions must emerge from discussion to be held in Parliament. But it is also true that Burke really supports a governing elite, subject to the control of voters at the polls, uh, even though what primarily uh, qualifies this elite is, is its morality and its knowledge, and not just bird rights. In 1769, in observations on a late publication entitled The Present State of the Nation, commenting on the suggestion made there that the number of voters should be increased, Burke says, I quote, what other reason can he have for suggesting that we are not happy enough to enjoy a sufficient number of voters in England? I believe that most sober thinkers on this subject are rather of opinion that our fault is on the other side, and that it would be more in the spirit of our constitution and more agreeable to the pattern of our best laws by lessening the number to add the, to the weight and independency of our voters. And truly considering the immense and dangerous charge of elections, the prostitutes and daring venality, the corruption of manners, uh, and the idleness and profligacy of the lower sort of voters, no prudent man would propose to increase such an evil if it be, as I fear it is, out of our power to administer to it any remedy." End of quote. Direct election was a necessity, but minimizing the unwanted effects of this consultation was of the utmost imprudence, and this objective was achieved by decreasing the number of voters, thus granting each of them greater weight and independence. In a bill for shortening the duration of parliaments, when he addresses the evils inherent in popular elections, he states, I quote, uh, to, gov to govern according to the sense and agreeably to the interests of the people is a great and glorious object of government. This object cannot be obtained but through the medium of popular election, and popular election is a mighty evil. Uh, it would be hasty to conclude from this uh, end of question, uh, end of quote. It would be hasty to conclude from these statements that work did not consider elections a good per se. After all, it is only through them that the glorious objective of governing according to the interests of the people is achieved. And his opinions on Wilkes' case proves it. Rather, it must be understood that, as it happens in Burke's assessment of other matters, popular elections are a good with an evil, with an evil associated with them. In fact, Burke recognizes that government action in which parliamentarians participate is a qualified action, which can only be performed by those who have the necessary skills, in accordance with it, the eminently rational nature of political action. 
in speech on the plan for economical reform, Bert defines the parliamentary task as I quote, the people are the masters. They have only to express their wants at large and in gross. We are expert artists. We are the skillful workmen to shape their desires into the perfect form and to fit the utensil to their use. They are the sufferers. They tell the symptoms of the complaint, but we know uh, the exact seat of the disease and how to apply the remedy according to the rules of art. End of quote. Problems are presented by voters in an imprecise and vague way because they are not seen from the Igus perspective which characterized the vision of the ruler. The ruler needs to have a deep and broad knowledge of reality in order to know how to apply the remedy to the origin of the evil. Uh, that is why he appears as a specialist in solving the problems that first vo voters suffer. The use of this term illustrates the passive role that Burke assigns to the people in matters of governance. The representatives are qualified to find solutions because they are, I quote, the philosophers in action, end of quote, and they must solve the problems presented to them. According to the opinions of those who elected them, perhaps, when it coincides with that of the parliamentarian himself. And because the parliamentarian's action is a rational one, it certainly does not coincide with the fleeting of opinion that changes with the fashion of the day, but rather agrees with the opinion that they would probably maintain five years from now. I quote, I'm to look indeed to your opinions, but to such opinions as you and I must have five years hence, end of quote. That is, according to the result of the assessment of the situation and the, their possible evolution, an opinion that is a qualified opinion and more than a momentary inclination. inclination. While advocating for parliamentarian's independence from direct voter instructions in the name of their true interests, he states, I quote, I knew that you choose me to be a pillar of the state and not a weathercock on the top of the edifice, exalted for my levity and versatility and of no use but to indicate the shiftings of every fashionable gale. Finally, in a letter to the Duke of Portland in September 1780, he states, I quote, uh, I shall always follow the popular humor and endeavor to lead it to the right points at any expense of private interest or party interest. But, but as to leaving to the crowd to choose for me what principles I ought to hold or what course I ought to pursue for their benefit, I had much rather mix with them with the utter ruin of all my hopes than to betray them by learning lessons from them." End of quote. While Burke is elitist in terms of his view of those who have the ability to elect and those who have the ability to govern, it does not mean that Burke favors an aristocratic society protected against social mobility, but rather that he supports an ordained pyramidal society where mobility is the result of merit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ivan uh, Moreira. After the, those technical problems, we'll go back to Professor Jan Krau, which is among us again. Okay, uh, it is my pleasure to give the floor again to you, for, for you, Professor. To 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 uh, um, deliver your 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 presentation, if you may. And mute yourself, please, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And I do apologise for that. I I must have fallen foul of Twitter. But the uh, question that I was uh, going to ask, relating to uh, Western liberal democracy nowadays, is when and how did the quality of toleration become antagonistic to ordered liberty. And as a starting point, I want to reconsider Edmund Burke's approach to religious toleration in his day. Religious perspectives continue to dominate approaches to political and social policy throughout the 18th century. And it might be argued by analogy that we even have our own version of the Test and Corporation Acts today where access to positions of political and cultural influence 
is dictated by, at least outwardly, conformity to an increasingly narrow ideological mindset and vocabulary. Burke's approach to religious toleration pivoted on this question. Is toleration a privilege or a right? If the first, what are the circumstances in which that privilege might reasonably be limited? If it is a right, what is the rationale for its consistent application in the face of changing circumstances? Burke was famously uncomfortable arguing from the basis of rights. And I suspect that most people acquainted with his thought would assume that he lines up with the former option, that toleration is a privilege dependent upon its conformity to the customs and traditions of society. This impression does indeed appear to follow the trajectory of his thinking on the subject from the 1770s to the 1790s, as his initially liberal approach narrowed with the rise of radical political movements in Britain in the outbreak of the French Revolution. A prominent supporter of relief for both Protestant dissenters and Roman Catholics in the early part of his career, Burke was prepared to argue that he supported toleration as a principle, this is a quotation, favorable to Christianity and as a part of Christianity. And yet in 1790, he abstained on a vote on Protestant relief and he stridently opposed relaxing restrictions on Unitarians two years later, arguing that Unitarianism, quote, mingled a political system with religious opinions. I suggest, however, that we can detect in the same materials and the same trajectory an approach to toleration that is situated more firmly in the area of a right, and one which, when understood as such, provides a rationale both for its own boundaries and for intolerance when those boundaries are transgressed. Burke's early support for religious toleration followed familiar Enlightenment thought in reconfiguring what might reasonably remain the preserve of private conscience. But he vitally complicated that position by his acknowledgement of an unbought grace of life to which institutional religion testified in both natural and civil human society, and which evaded theological or ecclesiological precision. Indeed, Burke's thinking here might almost be said to resemble Rousseau's civil religion. In a speech on clerical subscription in 1772, he stated, who were more religious than the Romans? Who were more tolerating? Methinks we would do well to attend to their institutions. And yet, Burke diverged widely from Rousseau in going on to argue that the established church must be a voluntary institution, integral to and yet distinct from the state within which it performs its vital function. A religious establishment aims to unify the whole community in its natural moral instincts. But by the very mystery of its own incorporation, it cannot impose doctrinal uniformity on the whole community, only on its own members. Burke presents us here with a paradox crucial to his understanding of religious toleration. While religion witnesses to the pre-existing moral purpose of civil society, and thus its own fundamental importance for civil liberty and order, any institution founded on revelation cannot claim anything but an imperfect and partial knowledge of the form that that moral purpose should take in civil society. So why did Burke emphatically reject toleration for Unitarians? Well, the answer is perfectly consistent with his earlier position on toleration where Burke was careful to draw a clear but narrow line between those who denied revelation and, quote, those who do not hold to revelation yet, but wish that it were proved to them. The former, atheists and deists, he declared outlaws of the constitution of the human race, never to be supported, never to be tolerated. 
since they would deprive us of our best privilege and prerogative of human nature, that of being a religious animal. The latter, who wished revelation to be proved to them, but didn't believe it, crucially, Burke allowed within the scope of what he called serious religion. Unitarianism failed the test of serious religion, not primarily, I think, because it incorporated a political system, but because it denied the revelation signified in the Trinity of the mysterious paradox that Burke saw underpinning artificial or civil society, that man is poised in tension, as it were, with a foot both in eternity and in time. And Burke reasoned further on this point. Toleration of Unitarianism, like atheism and deism, could only be legitimized by subordinating serious religion to civil duty, a move that would result in religious slavery. That chain of reasoning by which Burke sniffed the onset of slavery from a surfeit of toleration might also be explained by his encounter as an undergraduate at Trinity College, Dublin, with the work of Samuel Puffendorf, whose teaching secularized notions of justice, toleration, duty, and conscience as a rational way of stifling denominational strife with mutually referential concepts of civil law and personal liberty. Such arguments likely proved helpful to the Protestant Irish elite, but they would hardly have been conducive to the young Edmund Burke a vigorous critic of the Popery Laws in his native Ireland, who in 1790 vividly described such subordination of serious religion to the perceived interests of civil society as, quote, annihilating the God within man and violating him in his sanctuary. Ironically, though, Burke had an ally to hand in that same college text. Puffendorf's Huguenot translator and editor, Jean Barberac, whose textual notes, while accepting that the boundaries of toleration should be rational and reasonable, and which Huguenot wouldn't, reinserted the purchase of a pre-political religious conscience within the modern state, and in so doing inscribed his own clear but narrow line beyond which civil duty might have to be subordinated to serious religion. To summarize, first, Burke's understanding of toleration seems inextricably bound up with mystery and paradox, or rather, to put it in a better way, I think, is incompatible with certainty. Secondly, if it is to operate beneficially for the preservation of both order and liberty, Toleration must, must spring from a higher purpose of the state than either individual liberty or social order. In other words, toleration is something one must bear in order to achieve a final good. Or as Burke put the case in 1773, do not promote diversity. When you have it, bear it. I think what Burke is saying is we tolerate because we are bound to do so, not by someone else's natural right, but by a just awareness of our own limitations. Toleration is a right embedded in civil society for the sake of civil society, for the fullest realization of human being and human becoming. So if Burke's approach to toleration contains any message to us nowadays, I suggest that it is this. Unless we are able to reattach closely toleration to a live awareness of the paradox of human flourishing in civil society, that as creatures we are in a state both of being and becoming, we will remain vulnerable to an internal authoritarian threat to liberal democracy, masquerading as tolerance, where the intolerant appear to have all the best tunes and the skeptical or resistant, as in Burt's Britain, are silenced by or even beholden to the slogans of a hate-fueled philanthropy. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. And, and now we let move, let's move to the last, uh, last but not least. The, the last speaker, uh, Professor Luke Xian, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. In the quest for community, the American sociologist Robert Nisbet offered his famous critique of modern political order that it is fundamentally an alliance between state and individual against traditional communities. Rather, rather than the common rendering of modern political controversies as statism versus individualism, Nisbet saw the two working in tandem to undermine social groups of various sorts with the state asserting the autonomy of the individual against the claims of the social group and thereby increasing its own power. Nisbet's solution at the end of the book is all too brief, arguing for a laissez-faire of groups. Only two pages long, the solution offers little in the way of policy prescriptions or even a general outline of a vision of what an alternative to the modern political structure of individual and state might look like. One that takes account of the modern social, political, and economic realities. Nisbet's best articulation of what he sees as the alternative to the modern political community is what he calls the plural community in the last chapter of the social philosophers, an underappreciated and uh, under Red Book, published 20 years after Quest. In Quest, Nisbet describes two tendencies in political thought, monism and pluralism. The first emphasizes unity, the of political order. The second, plurality, the manyness of political community. These two tendencies guide social thought in a variety of ways for Nisbet. In The Social Philosophers, Nisbet describes how monism plays out in the history of social philosophy. There he describes three types of community that fit the monist mold the military community, the political community, and the revolutionary community. Each of these forms of community emphasizes the indivisibility of power and the individual shorn of other social attachments. In essence, each manifests the fundamental dichotomy of centralized power and individual in its conception of communal order. Furthermore, each conceives the state individual dichotomy as essential to the highest form of communal attachment. All of them are inherently opposed to traditional social groups' claims of authority and membership. Nisbet perceives the state as an idea system, as an ideological construct arising out of man's quest for community and the thought of many of the greatest social philosophers in Western history, Plato, the Roman lawyers, Bodin, Machiavelli, Hobbes, and especially Rousseau. Each of them wrote in the context of intense social conflict, perceiving, perceiving the political power as the means of securing social order and of secure community for individuals who had lost their traditional attachments to more ancient forms of community. Rousseau especially saw the state as not just a source of order, but of moral order, release of the individual from the suffocating social bonds of traditional social authorities. Writing in The Social Philosophers, Nisbet describes six elements of the plural community. Plurality, autonomy, decentralization, hierarchy, tradition, and localism. Plurality is the idea that the plural community is not founded upon a single objective or pursuit, whether kinship, religion, or politics, but upon a plurality of communities, each holding its proper and due place in a larger From this idea emerges the idea of communitas communitatum, community of communities. Each smaller community is autonomous within its own realm according to the nature of its particular function. The other elements support this fundamental orientation toward plurality toward many uh, rather than the one. The second element, functional community, uh, functional autonomy, follows from the first. So Nisbet means that groups are autonomous as much as possible as to their function. They're endowed with the greatest possible autonomy consistent with the performance of their function and with performance by many other groups of communities of the functions embedded in them by tradition or plan. The third element is decentralization. By this, Nisbet means that authority should not come from one source as in the political or military communities. Rather, authority should be decentralized, dispersed through many groups in the community. Hierarchy is the idea that every community has a stratification of function and responsibility. This is true of dyads, to, uh, uh, from dyads to large organizations to nation states. Now, rather than lamenting this fact, the plural community celebrates it as an essential part of any genuine community. Tradition is the fifth element of the plural community. It means the customary and the habitual, as well as the sense of a handing down, the transferring of ideals and practices. 
the plural community sees tradition as something emerging from community, from consensus, from a stable base of social interaction that makes law in the formal and prescriptive sense unnecessary. The tradition is the collection of customs and habits that develop organically within a community. The final element is localism, by which Nisbet means the emphasis on the family, neighborhood, small, small community, and local association. Historically, the plural philosophers objected to the effects of industrialism and democratic society on the grounds that it caused massive dislocations from place. They believed that the rootlessness resulting from the loss of connection to the local community is a prime cause of alienation in the modern world. The political orientation of pluralism is complex. While Nisbet understands the modern manifestation of pluralism to have its origins in the 18th century conservative reaction to Hobbes, Rousseau, and the French Revolution, it has a much more ecumenical pedigree in the 19th century. In The Social Philosophers, Nisbet organizes his chapter on the plural community by discussing it as essentially the inverse of the political. He names Plato, the first, uh, just as he named Plato the first philosopher of the political community, so he names Aristotle the first of the plural community, where Ma uh, Machiavelli and Verdun are the first modern philosophers of the political community, Althusius, who fell between Bodin and Hobbes is the first modern philosopher of the plural community. Most importantly in the modern world is Edmund Burke. And Burke uh, separates uh, three types of modern pluralism, conservative pluralism, liberal pluralism, and radical pluralism. So he sees pluralism as having adherence in each of the three major modern ideologies, with Edmund Burke being the godfather of each of them. For Nisbet, Burke opposed centralized arbitrary power wherever it might be found. Throughout his career, this required hostility to the British East India Company, attacks upon British actions in the American colonies in Ireland, and most famously, his opposition to the French Revolutionary Jacobins. Burke's goal remained the same, no matter where his attacks were aimed, protect the plural structure of society and oppose the centralization of power. He defended the decentralized kinship and village structure of India, solitary neglect that led to political and even cultural differences between the American colonies and the British homeland, the religious differences of the Irish and the Indians, the traditional organization of French society. So for Nisbet, Burke was a pluralist as well as a conservative, and his pluralism was not limited to conservative insights or even traditionalist predilections. Uh, Louis uh, de Bonal was also a conservative pluralist for Burke. He opposed the French Revolution for its centralizing tendencies. Friedrich Hegel, Nisbet uh, situates among the conservative pluralists, a little uncomfortably in my view, because of his early devotion to the political state, but he also promoted a plural view of society, one that was centered not on the individual, but upon a variety of centers of authority through which the state ruled his intermediary associations. The conservative emphasis upon the authority of social institutions and the functional autonomy of these associations uh, that, that are necessary for them to exercise the legitimate authority. Liberal pluralists focused upon the necessity of plurality of social groups and the individual's freedom of association. Robert de Lemonet and Alexis de Tocqueville are Nisbet's examples of liberal pluralists. Lemonet commenced his career a staunch conservative and defender of the autonomy of the Roman Catholic Church, but he eventually applied his analysis to other associations, especially those that were liberal and radical. Nisbet writes, from a position in which he argued for the complete autonomy of the church and society, Lemonet had by 1830 reached the point of arguing for the autonomy of all associations in society, including those new kinds that conservatives tended to distrust, labor unions, cooperatives, and liberal political parties. But he was extending to new forms of association in society, the same rights of autonomy, of communal status in the law that he had first sought only for the church." End quote. So Lemonet's goal was freedom for all associations, old or new. Individualism for Lemonet was too weak as an ideology to protect the individual. The individual needed a plurality of liberty for a variety of groups. Tocqueville is for Nisbet, as for many, the best modern commentator on the effects of, uh, of society on modern democracy, uh, or the effects on society of modern democracy and egalitarianism. Tocqueville saw in a, the American order a pluralism of authority and a vast array of voluntary associations. And the vibrancy of these associations demonstrated the potential for democratic society to develop in a manner that would not centralize power and authority in the democratic state, but would leave a variety of countervailing authorities in which individuals could seek refuge for the leveling effects of democratic society. 
a radical pluralist, the third group that Nisbet sees is drawing from Burke's pluralism, include Pierre Joseph Proudhon and Peter Kropkin. Proudhon advocated the idea of mutualism, a system of common property ownership that might replace capitalism. The system was based upon naturally mutual ties, kinship, the local community, and the like. Each of these groups would maximize the amount of functional autonomy regarding matters that affected it alone. Peter Kropkin, like Proudhon, was anti-capitalist, uh, but he also hated the centralized political and economic system inaugurated by the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, he was radical in his belief that the present social and political world was hopelessly corrupt. The base of, basis of his ideal society, though, was plural. It was based upon mutual aid and cooperation, a variety of social units that could be the central, uh, the most important units of a new society. It would be decentralized, peaceful, and where individuals would live in harmony with each other around mutually beneficial arrangements. So the radicals were radical. They wanted to overturn existing society, but the new society they wanted to create was as far as possible from the centralized regimes of the radical monists, the Marxist and the Jacobins. Tolerance between these two systems, the monist system and the pluralist system, is quite different. Tolerance under the monist system applies to individuals and individuals alone. There's little tolerance for groups that might claim a higher allegiance of their individual members against that of the state. And Nisbet sees these divergent understandings of community um, and what they might mean for communal and localized living um, in the modern context anyways, being derived from Edmund Burke. Are you finished, sir? Yep. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have eight minutes left. So uh, I have a couple of questions here. I am going to choose uh, uh, the first one that I will hand back to the floor to hear your remarks about it. Um, I will like to um, select this one, uh, which is more appropriate to the team. Um, it's from uh, an, a student from the IEP, and uh, his question is, uh, let me see. Uh, um, and the question is as follows. Are our prejudices threatened by both retroactive and revolutionary conservative nowadays and um, that's the question of the student i i, I can i can, I can I repeat the, the question because uh, uh, the, the question is are our prejudice threatened by both retroactive and revolutionary conservatives nowadays I would like to, to hear the, the remarks of, of the panel, if, 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 you, if you might, please. Well, I, I can take a brief stab at it. Uh, I, I, I don't want to speak for, uh, there are so many strains of thought and politics operating under the name of conservatism now that I, I don't want to attempt yes. to speak for all of them. I, I, I do think it is worth keeping in mind uh, the, the prejudice for Burke, I think, is not um, immovable. It is a position that um, uh, that states that not every question is uh, 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 to be uh, assessed de novo. It is to be they, they are to be assessed from uh, from perspectives. Uh, I think Tocqueville's uh, admonition is admonition is, is very good on this, which is if there were not a certain number of dogmas, we would never make it through the day. Uh, if we had to examine every question anew, the, the question is simply where they come from. Thank yes, you very much. And, and I think that uh, uh, prejudice, as uh, Burke uh, assessed it, uh, was uh, quite different from uh, the, the connotation we today have for prejudices. So uh, uh, prejudice in the Burke sense, uh, uh, that is, uh, assessing a question, uh, uh, taking into account what is the tradition uh, and what is the, um, the cultural uh, assessment of the, the, uh, the question and uh, taking the prejudice as a, a quick way to, uh, to adhere or to um, 
or to uh, mobilize our uh, our will uh, and uh, into action um, can be threatened uh, to our day in our days can be threatened uh, in both sides. It's true, but um, but it is uh, uh, it is I think um, a question of. Um, uh, it is a question of uh, adhering to our our um, our beliefs uh, and working uh, on the present uh, according to them, uh, and that we can uh, do in spite of being uh, threatened by uh, conservatives or by uh, or by revolutionaries. So. Uh, it is an option uh, that is uh, in in the reach of uh, each one of us. I think. I thank you very much. Yeah. I would I'd say that. Yeah, I'd say that. I mean, anything can anything can be converted into an ideology, and I, and I, I suppose one of the underlying points of my own interest in Burke is this question of what is ideology, how has it developed, and so on. And conservatism as an ideology would be, uh, if it is, it is forced into uh, an ideological mindset, could be detrimental to prejudice as far as, as uh, Dr. Uh, Yvonne says, uh, prejudice is seen in Burke's sense of the word. There's something that sort of can, can restrain us, can sort of hold, at least can make us hesitate before the point of doing something that could be, um, you know, immoral or imprudent to go to go to, to Greg's point. And I think this is is, is largely because of, uh, I, I believe that ideas held ideologically inevitably poison um, the that um, partnership that Burke spoke about with with the past and with the future. Uh, it can do virtually nothing other than see everything in terms of the present, even when, as with Marxism, it attempts to incorporate the practices, the lessons, the experience of history. It does so in a way that that violates it uh, in terms of a sort of a present imposition upon uh, upon things there. Uh, and so this is a, maybe one of the reasons we see nowadays that that, that either we appropriate the past in a way that is totally irresponsible and mindless, or we try to cut ourselves off from it entirely. Um, and I think conservatives can, in some senses, be um, uh, prone to that sort of thing uh, as well. OK, thank you very much. Professor Lukian, your remarks, please. Uh, yeah. I think the other panelists covered pretty well. I, I don't think it's, um, I'm not sure that the, uh, the major threats, uh, I, I think the, the question uh, can presume to, uh, a Burkean understanding of prejudice is a good thing, I think. Um, and the, I'm not sure if the major threats are coming from various um, movements, at least in America, from, um, um, from even our uh, various strains of conservatism that are dubiously so-called. Um, it seems, at least on this side, it's the threats to kind of the, the good prejudgments that we have to be um, um, from radical elements, mostly over here. Okay, you finished? Yep. Uh, you finished your remark? Okay, uh, well, we have just a couple of seconds. It's quite difficult to, to um, I would like... Well, I think it's, it's all the questions are very uh, wide and it's difficult to, to answer in 30 seconds the, uh, with some, some sense to these questions. And more of them, uh, most of them, they are completely focused on the present time uh, and not on political philosophy. Of, uh, and so I, I, I think it's much more prudent and, uh, to uh, thank you, the panel, uh, the, for your uh, availability, disposition, and intelligence on in, in your presentations. It was for me a, a pleasure to host this, um, this session and also uh, a, a final word for our, our audience that is always there. 
uh, we cannot see them, but they are all there scattered around the world. Okay, thank you very much indeed. It was my pleasure, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.